Yeah, yeah, we'll see how it turns out. <laughs> I did fail to mention, going back to the gift of prophecy real quick, uh, prophets do see life in black and white. Uh, that's a good characteristic, unless it's just extreme. Like I said, uh, they need, especially they need a mercy around them on a regular basis because those two gifts naturally balance each other out. And thus a mercy needs a prophet, as you're, as you're going to see, because, well, I'll wait till we get to that because you'll see that mercies can go the other way too far. Um, so another misuse of a prophet is, you know, it's like they, they stick a knife in you, but then they turn it. Well, because they want people to repent. And, uh, but again, they have to have mercy. And this is my own illustration of a prophet. Uh, they're like the brakes on the car. Uh -oh. uh, because, like I said, they seem negative. And it's like they're against more than they are for. Stop doing this. Don't do that. You know, that's sin. You can't do that. You can't live like that. So they're like the brakes on a car, but uh, who would want to get in a car without brakes, right? Yeah. But also, the brakes have all the friction, the heat. So they catch a lot of heat because of that gift. So just understand the problem a little bit more. Okay, we left off with this gift. The giver, or the gift of giving. So, uh, we alluded to this earlier. They have the ability to make wise purchases and investments. You know, practically, practically speaking, they know how to get a good buy. And uh, they also have the ability to make money. Now, they don't have to be millionaires. Uh, although, I know some Christians that are millionaires, and uh, you would never know it if you met them, because they're very humble. But if you knew them, you know that they give large amounts of their money away. Yeah, they have some nice houses, and they drive nice cars too, but uh, the ones I know are giving hundreds of thousands of dollars away. The man that bought us our house. Uh, I hardly knew him. Met him once, I think. And he heard my first wife and I were looking for a house to rent because we didn't believe in mortgages. So he said, I was sitting in my church, Daniel, one day, and the Lord prompted me and said, Buy Dan and Kathy a house. <laughs> yeah. So his secretary called us up. Actually, the secretary of the church he went to and said, so-and-so, uh, actually, my wife took the call. I was here at the office, and we had just had Rachel, uh, his future wife, and uh, we are living in an apartment up in Standale, and if you've had children, you know how once you have a child, your apartment can become small real quick, just all the furniture they have, you know, swinging chair and crib changing table and all that. So my wife and I thought, well, we, we need to look for a bigger place to rent. But this guy was prompted to buy us a house. And so uh, he just took $80,000 of his own money and bought us the house we live in. So, uh, yeah. I've noticed through the years that not many Christians have this gift. <laughs> but uh, he can trust, the Lord can trust a few people with this gift. Uh, I don't have it. It's not my gift. <laughs> I think I can make wise purchases, but uh, I'm certainly not wealthy. Now, again, you can have this gift and not be wealthy. There's a young man, not, not young so long, any longer, but he's in our ministry and he would be considered poor. But uh, this is a, his gift. 
Let's look at some other characteristics. They desire to give quietly to effective projects or ministries. Thus, they avoid pressure uh, of publicity. It's interesting to me, so many of these ministries that beg for money, they're actually turning off givers. Yep, by doing I agree. That. They say plant fifty dollars, you get a thousand for full return. All you gotta do is plant the seed. Yeah. Givers reject that kind of pressure. Okay? They attempt to use their giving to motivate others to give, which is okay. They have a real alertness to valid needs, which they fear others might overlook. Thus, they enjoy in meeting needs without the pressure of appeal, as we just talked about. They have a real joy when they know that their gift was an answer to specific prayer. That's why when someone gives to us personally, or to our ministry, and I know their gift is giving, I specifically share with them that they, their gift was an answer to a specific prayer. Because it just encourages them. If they're married, they have a dependency on their partner's counsel to confirm the amount that they are giving. They are concerned that their gift is high quality. And they desire to feel a part of the work or person to whom they give. Thus, a giver has an ability to discern wise investments. They are motivated to use their assets of time, money, and possessions to advance the work of the Lord. If a person with a gift of giving has limited funds, he is still able to use his ability of recognizing available resources and draw upon them when needed. Bill gives this illustration of a millionaire couple, Christian, that when they would go shopping, they would each go to a separate grocery store. And back in those days when he was telling the story, they had a walkie-talkie. They didn't have cell phones back then. But they each had a, like a walkie-talkie. And they'd be going down the same aisle with the same produce. And one wife, the wife would say, hey, this store has this on sale for this amount. And the man would say, well, that's not on sale here. Let's get that where you're at. And you would think to yourself, they're millionaires. They don't have to do this. Yeah, they don't. But this is how they became millionaires. They learned how to give a good buy. And their whole life was conducted this way. But they still did it, even though they were millionaires. You know, saving. And they, they would tell Bill, they would say, Bill, it's not the amount that we're saving, it's the percentage. <coughs> the percentage, that's what adds up. And so uh, <coughs> they just had that ability. Now, you can imagine how they can misuse their gift or be misunderstood. The need to deal with large sums of money may appear to be a focus on temporal values. That's how others may misunderstand them. Their desire to increase the effectiveness of a ministry by their gift may appear as an attempt to control the work that they're giving to or the person. Their attempt to encourage others to give may appear as a lack of generosity and unnecessary pressure. Their lack of response to pressure appeals may appear that they're not generous. And their personal frugality by which they live may appear to friends and relatives as selfish in not meeting their wants. That's the key there. Not their needs, but their wants. So uh, that's why givers want to give secretly, because obviously they don't want it to be broadcast that they have this ability to make money, because obviously people want to come to them, right, for a handout. Uh, <clears throat> thus, they want to give secretly. 
and it's scriptural. That's right. That's right, Charles. Uh, also in the book here, a giver who is not in fellowship with the Lord will begin to feel guilt as he stores up funds. If he is preparing for a special need, he must have the reassurance from the Lord that his plans are according to God's will. This is not up here, but their frugality may often cause, if they're married, have children, their wife and children, to get jealous, especially if they're depriving their wife or their children in order to give to others. So you can see where that could be a problem within a family. It can also cause people to look to them rather than the Lord, and they can also wait too long to give if they're not listening to the Holy Spirit's leading. Okay, so that's the giver, or the gift of giving. Uh, a giver some time ago, or a person with this gift came to me recently, or some time ago I should say, and they said this, I receive such joy from giving, quote unquote. Then they said this, I have so much money to give. <laughs> and uh, that just illustrates the fact that she has that gift. And uh, they receive joy from it, and they have a lot to give. Bill tells a story that he was sharing this at a pastor's seminar. I've gone to several of these. And uh, he was wanting to know how many had this gift. So he said, how many here think have, they have this gift of giving? Raise your hand. And more than any other gift, everyone else was looking. Because <laughs> they wanted to know who had all the money, <laughs> supposedly. But uh, you know, pastors like to know who might have the money to help their ministry, but that's, that would be wrong. Okay, organization or administration. What is the characteristics of this gift? Well, they have the ability to see the overall picture and to clarify long-range goals. They are motivated to organize that for which they are responsible. They have a desire to complete tasks as quickly as possible. They're aware of the resources that are available to complete the task. They have a real ability to uh, delegate, to know what can or cannot be delegated. They have a tendency to stand on the sidelines until those in charge turn over responsibility to them. They have a tendency to assume responsibility if no structural leadership exists. They have a willingness to endure reaction from workers in order to accomplish the ultimate task. They have a real fulfillment in seeing all the pieces come together and others enjoying the finished product. And they have a desire to move on to a new challenge when a previous task is fully completed. They also have a need that those that work with them are loyal to them. Obviously, this helps complete the task. Uh, they have an ability to make jobs look easy, even though they may not be. An organizer has the ability to take seemingly impossible tasks and break them down into achievable goals. They're very alert to details. They're able to be decisive because the final goal is clearly visualized by the organizer. He's able to quickly evaluate requests and situations and make firm decisions. And also completion involves cleanup. Now, how can they be misunderstood or misuse their gift? Their ability to delegate responsibility may appear that they're being lazy. 
avoiding the work. But no, they're more gifted to organize everyone else. Tell everyone else what to do. Okay, yeah, that's another way to put it. <laughs> Willingness to endure reaction may appear as to be callous. Or unresponsive to appeals. The neglect in explaining why tasks must be done may prompt other workers to feel that they're being misused or used. The viewing of people as resources may appear that projects are more important than people. And then the desire to complete tasks swiftly may appear to be insensitive to the schedule, weariness, or priorities of those working with them or for them. This is not on the overhead, but they will be loyal, even show favoritism to those working under them that are more diligent than others. For obvious reasons, they can be more loyal to them. They can also have a tendency to overlook workers' serious faults. If an organizer is given a position of authority in the local church, he will appoint workers on the basis of their ability to get the job done. If serious character flaws are discovered in the valuable worker, the organizer will be reluctant to dismiss them because they know overall that that worker can help finish the task. So, that's the organizer. Which brings us to the last gift. Gift of mercy. Or gift of mercy. Okay. The ability to feel an atmosphere of joy or distress in an individual or a group. This is their strong point. Someone was to come again into this room none of us had ever met before, and that person was hurting even like the opening illustration, even before maybe they would speak, a person with a gift of mercy could sense something is hurting or someone is hurting. Thus, they are attracted to and understand people who are in distress much quicker than the, all the other six gifts. Thus, they have a desire to remove hurts and bring healing to others. Talked about my first wife having this gift. Often she would say to me, because she knew what I was going to preach on, she would say, Daniel, now go easy on them. <laughs> go easy on them. Don't be so hard on them. That was just her gift speaking. They have a greater concern for mental distress than physical distress. The server would be the opposite, right? The server would be more concerned about physical distress than mental or emotional. An avoidance of firmness unless they see how it will bring benefits. Bill tells the story. If there were four mercies in a car and they were looking for a place to eat. These are four mercies now. They would drive around for hours because, possibly, because they were all afraid to offend or not go to a place the others didn't want to go to. <clears throat> sure you want to eat there? We won't go there if you don't want to. Someone would have to just step up and say, let's, let's go here. <laughs> <laughs> Thus they're sensitive to words and actions which will hurt others. Thus, they also have an ability to discern sincere motives in other people. They're very happy and unified with those who are sensitive to the needs and feelings of others. But they will close their spirit to those who are insincere or insensitive. Interestingly enough, though, people with this gift 
are drawn to prophets who are the exact opposite. Mercies are drawn to prophets. Uh, the old adage, you know, opposites attract. But uh, interestingly, that they are tendency, have a tendency to be drawn to prophets. Uh, Peter, the apostle, had the gift of prophecy. The apostle John had the gift of prophecy. <coughs> and you can see throughout Scripture where John was attracted to being with Peter. Even though Peter was much more harsh, John was much more merciful. Well, how can they be misunderstood? Their avoidance of firmness may appear to be weak and indecisive. Sensitivity to the spirit and feelings of others may cause some to feel he is guided by emotions rather than logic. And this next one is very important. If you're, if you're a mercy, watching this by video if you're here, you've got to be very careful of this one. The attraction and understanding of those in distress may be misinterpreted by those of the opposite sex. If someone is in distress emotionally and a mercy of the opposite sex shows empathy, obviously the person that's hurting is going to be drawn to that person. And if that person is the opposite sex, they both have to be careful because then, of course, you've all heard the stories. Counselors that are not aware of this are not careful can often fall into immorality with the very person who came to them for help. Follow me on that? Yep. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? <laughs> yeah. The insensitivity to words and actions which cause hurts may appear to be taking up others' offense. And the ability to detect insincere motives may cause some to feel they are hard to get to know. <clears throat> Also, they're deeply loyal to friends. A person with this gift will demonstrate loyalty to a friend by even reacting harshly toward those who attack them. They have a need for deep friendships. The very nature of a person with this gift of mercy requires close friendships. These friendships, however, must have mutual commitment, which is often reaffirmed. Citing the Apostle John again, you remember reading the Gospels, John enjoyed such a friendship with Christ. He was not only closer to Christ than most of the other disciples, but he's referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Again, they attract people that are in distress. They have a desire to remove hurts. They are attracted to prophets. Now, they have a real tendency to take up offenses. That is, if others are not empathizing with the person in pain as much as they are, they can be very offended. They can become possessive because they have that deep need to be close to those they are hurt by helping. They can become overly possessive. They can tolerate evil. That's why a mercy, just like a prophet needs a mercy around them, mercies need prophets around them because they have a tendency to overlook the reason why that person might be hurting, especially if it's a sin. The mercy may say, well, you know, God loves you anyway. But if the person, for the reason they're suffering is because of sin, that has to be pointed out too. But that's very hard for a mercy to do. Thus they fail to be firm. They lean on emotions more than reason. And again, they can even lead the opposite sex into sin. And uh, so on. Okay, so that's the seven gifts. That's the characteristics of them. Misuses, misunderstandings. Now, Any questions at this point? Okay. 
But yeah, um, mercy though, right? That could be um, harsh too, though, because sometimes God shows mercy, but He still He still disciplines us. That's what the mercy should have in balance. Exactly. Because you can still show mercy to someone, but you can do it correct them too, but still show them mercy. Exactly. You're right. Okay. How, how far do we show mercy? I mean, is there a, a line it? between uh, starting to If you give too much mercy, where now you're just enabling the person? Exactly. Exactly. That's where we have to be filled with the Spirit to be able to discern that fine line. And that's where mercy can go to a prophet, especially, and say, look, am I enabling here? No. And you see all this? That's why we're a body. And that's the other reason why we only have one of these gifts. Because if one Christian could have all seven, he wouldn't need other Christians. But as you understand this, you understand the idea and the importance of all this being teamwork in a local church or a ministry. Uh, you know, often uh, an issue comes up in our small ministry, especially about truth. And sometimes I'll go to Randy and I'll say, Randy, can you set, search this out? because he has more time, plus he enjoys research more than I do. And uh, so I'll go to Randy. I'll say, Randy, could you search this out, what the Bible has to say about this, or this particular teacher, for instance. And uh, because his gift is teaching, he enjoys it. He knows where to get the wisdom from. He's very adept now at getting wisdom off the Internet. And... Uh, so I appreciate that about him. And uh, so I'll go to him. I'll, uh, you know, glean wisdom from him. Or he'll help in a certain area like that. And uh, that's why I've been praying that we would have all seven gifts represented on our board. Right now we have uh, six on the board. We have three teachers. We have a mercy. We don't, I'm not sure what the other guy's gift is, and you have my gift, which I'm not going to tell you yet. Excellent. <laughs> On this last break, I asked your wife, well, do you know what your gift is? I'm not telling you till the end. It's <laughs> worse. <laughs> I like that firm. <laughs> One of those gifts was sped through very fast, so that gift might have a... Uh, that person might have a gift of shorthand because I couldn't even read as fast as you went through oh. the admin organization. Yeah. You didn't really give examples of the organization as much as you did with the other ones. Yeah. I didn't know if, didn't know somebody who had that or that's actually my secondary gift. Many people think that's my primary, that know me. Maybe because I'm the director of the mission here, but it's not my primary. I thought you could only have one gift. We do only have one gift, but let me clarify that's good, Chuck, because I don't have that gift, but I have the strong tendencies of it, the positive tendencies of it. Yeah. So it's not really, it's a misnomer for me to say a secondary gift. It's, um, I have a lot of its tendencies, but it's not my gift. Okay, Bill came up with these three illustrations, and uh, they really illustrate how these gifts work, if all seven gifts are present. First of all, he starts out with a church setting. Let's say seven men representing each of the spiritual gifts met to organize the ideal church. Here is what each one of them would probably emphasize. Okay? The person with the gift of prophecy would emphasize the need for well-prepared sermons exposing sin, proclaiming righteousness, 
and warning of judgment to come. The man with the gift of serving would emphasize practical assistance to each member of the church to encourage them and to help them fulfill their responsibilities. The teacher would say, well, we need in-depth Bible studies with special emphasis on the precise meaning of words. The exhorter would say, uh, we need personal counseling and encouragement for each member to assist them in applying the scripture principles in their daily living. The giver would say, we need generous programs of financial assistance to missionaries and other ministries. <coughs> The administrator would say, ah, we need smooth running organization throughout the church so that every phase will be carried out decently and in order. And the mercy would say, no, we need special outreach and concern for precise and varying feelings of individuals with a readiness to meet their needs. That would be perhaps the ideal church. Let's say you were at a family dinner and each of the seven gifts were represented in the family, and all of a sudden, someone dropped the dessert on the floor. Okay? Here's what each of them might say. The prophet would say this. That's what happens when you're not careful. They're motivated to correct that person's life. Mercy. Ah, don't feel so badly. It could have happened to anyone. Motivated to relieve embarrassment. Server, let me help you clean it up. Motivation to fulfill a need. Teacher, the reason that fell is that it was too heavy on one side. Motivation, discover why it happened. Exhorter, next time let's serve the dessert with a meal. Motivation to correct the future. Administration. Jim, would you get the mop? Sue, please help pick it up, and Mary, help me fix another dessert. And you can imagine what the giver would say. I'll be happy to buy a new dessert. Okay? Now, how about if all seven gifts were represented, and they went to visit someone in the hospital who was sick? This is how they might respond. Server, here's a little gift I brought you. Now, I brought your mail in, fed your dog, watered your plants, and washed your dishes. Okay? Mercy. I can't begin to tell you how I felt when I learned you were sick. How do you feel now? Organizer. Don't worry about a thing. I've assigned your job to four others in the office. <laughs> Prophet. What is God trying to say to you through this illness? Is there some sin you haven't confessed yet? Exhorter, how can we use what you're learning to help others in the future? Giver, you have insurance to cover this kind of illness? Teacher, I did some research on your illness and I believe I can explain what's happening. So, that's how the seven gifts might work in those situations. Okay. Now, if you're here or watching on by way of video, and you've narrowed it down to two or three possibilities, these questions might help you. Let's say you're struggling whether to know it's prophecy or teaching. Well, ask yourself this. If you're limited to either doing research for a lesson or presenting that lesson, which would you choose? Okay, think about that. If you're limited to either doing the research or presenting it. Well, obviously the teacher would enjoy more doing the research and the prophet more would enjoy more presenting it. Do you enjoy research in order to present that which you have learned or in order to clarify and prove that which has been taught? So it's again obvious the teacher would be motivated to do the research to clarify and prove. The prophet would be to present. How about if you were struggling between whether a prophecy or exhorter? Ask yourself this, do you enjoy speaking more to a group or to an individual? Because again, a prophet enjoys the group, and 
individ, uh, exhorter enjoys the individual. Not that they can't speak to a group, but even with a group, uh, an exhorter would, in their mind, be thinking they're only talking to one person, even though a group would be present. When speaking to a group, do you receive greater joy from seeing an immediate response of commitment, or do you enjoy the opportunity to counsel as a result of speaking? Do you enjoy personal follow-up to encourage spiritual growth or in order to confirm and strengthen the commitment that a person has made? How about between serving or mercy? Are you more comfortable in helping to meet the practical needs of others or meeting their mental and emotional needs? So that's an easy one. Teaching or mercy? Are you more concerned with the atmosphere of a worship service or the scriptural pattern of a worship service? Serving or ruling? If you were given the responsibility to organize for activity, would you prefer delegating the responsibilities to others or perform most, perform most of the responsibilities yourself? Which do you enjoy most, short-range projects or long-range projects? By the way, the way these gifts work, we've already alluded to it. Profit and mercy are opposites. Uh, is it exhorting and serving? Then you have uh, exhorting, serving, organizing, or would be organizing, serving. I forget now. But gift giving stands alone. That's kind of, that one stands alone. But definitely profit, mercy, organizing, serving, exhorting, teaching. There you go. That's the six that kind of uh, are opposites of each other. Okay, we're almost done. Let's look at uh, <clears throat> what the handout has to say. Biblical examples. Touched on a couple already. Mr. Godfrey brings out that Peter had the gift of prophecy. Uh, let's go back to Romans real quick. I need to clarify something there. Romans 12. teaching, you may wonder why, again, how did Bill come up with these amplifications or applications? We read through from verses 6 through 8, the seven gifts, but in the Greek, the original language, nine, verses 9 through 16 are the amplifications of each gift. That's why when he mentions the gift of prophecy, in verse 6, verse 9 is the amplification of it. And you would find this if you di uh, diagrammed like you do in languages. Verse 9 the, uh, explains the gift of prophet. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cling to that which is good. Verse 10 is the amplification of the uh, server. Be kindly affectioned. one to another, showing brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Teacher, verse 11, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Exhorter, exhorter, verse 12, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. It's interesting, uh, most exhorters I know, they are weak when it comes to pr their prayer life. And I guess that's why the Holy Spirit, through Paul, is saying, you exhorters, you have to 
pay a special attention to be an instant in prayer. Giving is the next, and that's where verse 13 describes, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. He that rules, or administration, is verse 14. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. And then mercy, verse 15. You're able to rejoice with them that rejoice, and weep with them that weep. So again, the mercy is not only have the real ability to empathize with the hurting, but also rejoice with those that are happy. So Peter illustrates the prophet. You can get this in the book if you purchase one. Timothy. Timothy was a gift, has a gift, of, or had the gift of serving. By the way, another problem with servers is they have stomach issues. A lot of them. Uh, and I've seen this to be true with different servers I know. Uh, my present wife, she has digestive problems. And uh, they flare up from time to time. That's her gift. And again, they can overwork themselves. And uh, they also have a tendency to have that inner tension that physical problems can come from. Thus, we know Timothy had this gift because Paul told him, take a little grape juice for your stomach ailments. So apparently Timothy had some issues. Luke. Luke was a person that had the gift of teaching. His gospel is more detailed than any of the other three. He wrote the book of Acts and he starts out by saying, you've heard some of these stories before, but I'm going to write this book, I'm going to write to you, Theophilus, to explain them in more detail. So, he illustrates that gift. I said Paul was an exhorter. You read his writings, again, uh, always exhorting his readers to more maturity giving steps of action, uh, illustrations. Well, let me ask you, does anyone, can anyone here think of a person that might have had the gift of giving in the Bible, in the New Testament? Barnabas? And they sold everything to the apostles? Barnabas? Was it Barnabas? Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm thinking everything? of a couple too. Well, Ananias and Sapphira? No. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they lied. They lied, but uh, they did give a lot to the church. They just lied about it. No, they tried to make it look yeah. bigger than it was. Another couple? Maybe? Get struck down. No, I'm thinking of that couple. Oh. They did it so they would. They took I know they did. What they did was wrong, but they still gave a lot. So. Well, they were trying to copy part. Saw what Barnabas did, so they yeah. emulated him, him, but then why? Good point. Yeah, but they, they, did it, they did it to make it look bigger than it was, though, because he said, Did you sell the land for so much? And yay. Yeah, they, they yeah kept that was the problem they lied. Yeah. Well, Matthew they didn't was give the full amount to the church, they kept back part of it. Matthew's an illustration. Matthew's an illustration? Matthew. Not only was he a converted tax collector, but uh, his gospel, his gospel, talks more about money than the other gospels. Now, Bill goes to the Old Testament to illustrate the gift of giver or the gift of administration. That would be Nehemiah, you know, rebuilding the walls. How he was able to delegate and all that. And of course, we look at John already as a person with a gift of mercy. Well, that's it. Is um is love any the... questions before we conclude? Go ahead. Is Charles. love the same thing as mercy? 
or are they two separate things? I would say mercy is a part of love. Mm -hmm. Okay, the time of reckoning now. Everyone's going to share what their gift is. And Bill says if you don't know what your gift is, that, that's not bad. Maybe you just need to you know, discern yet between two or three or one or two. That's sort of a question. Go ahead. Um, it's about the one gift. Is that the, the motivational gift? Is the one gift? Yes. And then it's applied through ministry? Or you say you have administration skills would be in the ministry. Then there's just three phases. You know, motivation, ministry, and manifestation. Exactly. Talk about the gift is the motivation. The gift, the, yeah, the one gift we have is the motivational gift, Romans 12. Then it could be applied in ministry and manifestation. Then we choose a ministry gift to exercise it through, okay. or God leads us to a... <clears throat> okay, I want that one clarified. Yeah, that Does that one. clarify? Yes. Yeah. Charles Bukowski, I know what your gift is, but tell everyone else. Serving. Serving. Robin Dana. Um, probably exhortation. Probably. <laughs> yeah. I, Do you have a strong? No, I've seen in life uh, different times there's different gifts that might come into action during, according to the situation, because I can see some of a little bit of all of them almost, but I guess the one that's most frequent would be <coughs> exhortation. <coughs> Is that pressure? Robin's I wanted that because oh. Robin's gotten to know me lately. I would, what, what would you think? Yeah. What do you think, mind, Robin? Mind. Um, you might be surprised, but I believe it's exhortation as well. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I am a little surprised. I figured you would be, but I <laughs> feel that. But you know, it's funny because um, on like tests I've taken before, and I feel like personally, I feel mercy is a big one for me. But um, as I was sitting here thinking about it, because you know I've gone through some big life changes recently, and um, I, I was starting to think along those lines as I was reading again down through so these cool. descriptions, exhortation was coming to mind as a new one that I would have never had before. So that's right. funny you mentioned that. Yeah. Thanks, man. So you're thinking that's what it is? Um, well, you know, they're going to be a close second. I'm not going to give up on mercy because I really, I yeah. do yeah. have that, but I know that. Yeah. Good. But, but yeah, the exhortation or even the teaching, possibly. But yet, you know, so many of them, like you said before, we have all of them, so it's a matter of just, you know, finding. Or at least we should be living all of all them. Of them. And so, yeah. Do you still have the questionnaire to? Specify, identify what your uh, gift may be. Yeah, I don't have any with me from that oh, other ministry. Okay. Does that really help? Yeah. Yes. I tried to call them. <clears throat> then it seemed like they just wanted email, <clears throat> so I emailed them and said, "Could you just send me, email me your phone number so I can order that way?" And they had never emailed back. This oh. booklet kind of has a, mm -hmm. a checklist where. You check on each category, and then the one you have the most checks should tell you yeah. how deep it is. It only has like five or six questions. This one. Right. What well, he's referring to is much more right. detail. Is that a different ministry too? Yeah. Okay. Have you seen the one he's referring to? No. Okay. That was helpful for you? Yeah. You clarified it for me. Yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot your name, brother. Jim. Jim. I would be certain. Clear? No doubt? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Good. Adam Woodwife. Uh, well, you gave me a test a while ago. Um, the one he's referring to. Yep. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of my traits go to uh, mercy, but overall, I mean, my gift is giving, I guess. But um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was gonna have my secret. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for making Keep it me safe. <laughs> Thanks for making me say it. 
<laughs> but I, Adam is going to be my son-in-law, Lord Mowing Hogger's first, and uh, we've been getting to know each other obviously over the last year, and I'm also counseling Adam and my daughter Rachel, because I've been asked to do the ceremony, but uh, yeah, you do display a lot of traits of a giver. Randall Craig Dykewell, tell the world <laughs> what your gift is. Still teaching. Still teaching. I enjoy research. Charles Johnson Schur. <laughs> uh, teaching. Because I, I like, I like, uh, I like learning about my faith, and I like studying it, and I like mm. knowing about it. Yeah, I see that. I'd say teaching. Cause I like, cause I've had a lot of time to study it and know what really scripture says, and you know, not go by what preacher says. But I like, I like knowing, I'm studying, you know, you know, I like knowing facts. Yeah. Well, you're describing the teacher right there. We've only known Charles what six weeks? <clears throat> About two months. About two months. So. Uh, cause I started what? Let me pray. End of February or February. Months. Yeah, yeah, only a couple months. Yeah. Guess I'm it, right? Yeah. Carol Dana. <laughs> Serving. Yeah. Pretty clear. Serving him mostly. No. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Yeah. Your gift is exhorting, so you exhort her to serve. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good combination. Was that, did I say that was two opposites? You did at first. Yes. And then it became organizing and serving. Exhorting and teaching. That made me laugh at first because both, uh, yeah, both your teach. children are serving and exhorting, so it's. Yeah. Maybe he <laughs> talks about that here. Let me. Somewhere in his publications. He talks about here how we should be challenged to see through the eyes of others. And uh, that goes a long way towards unification as well, not only in a marriage, but a family and a ministry. Uh, he had these opposites. Yeah, Rob's right. In the back, they have that test where you can uh, take a test yourself. You're not finding it right away. See where the beauty of knowing our gift would make it easier for us to say yes to God in circumstances when He calls on us. Yeah. You know, if, he, if we're in a situation and He says, Rob, I want you to uh, have this person engage more or whatever, uh, because it, now that I know or feel that that's my gift. You can apply it. I can apply it easier. It's easier to say yes when you have, think you have the tools. Mm -hmm. And it obviously is a tool. It's a skill. Yeah. What's that, Chet? I was just saying, uh, validating that. This gives you boldness and courage, confidence. Yeah. yeah. I can see that. Even Paul asked for boldness. Even Paul. He said, you prayed that I may open my mouth boldly. Yeah. To, to preach. I really believe God allowed that to be put in there because normally we think of Paul always having boldness, but if he had to pray for it, all that he displayed boldness, how much more 
we don't have to feel ashamed if we're not as bold as we think we should be. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, say goodbye. <laughs> All right. All right. I have a question though.